Welcome back to our 10th and last panel of today on nationalisms. Um, before I start, quick announcement. Somebody left a computer outside, just in case this is one of yours, or is it not? No, it is not. Okay, well, now I have a computer. That's lovely. Okay, then we'll, then we'll, uh, we'll probably uh, put it outside later on. Um, it, it was outside, so Ben, you had found it, right? Um, the, the staff upstairs asked me to ask whose computer it was. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, four panels, and before I just introduce very quickly, I should say that in this panel, very exceptionally and in a very Swiss way, we will end punctually, okay? Because afterwards, we immediately go for the last half hour long session, and I do know that some people would like to leave exactly at quarter past five, so I will go to exactly quarter to five, which may mean that some people can't ask their questions or that the answers need to be very brief. Anyway, so we have four people today. We start with Ronald Grigor Suni from the University of Michigan, uh, Logics of Nations and Empires from Definitions to Explanations. Then we have online Shelen uh, Wu from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Bringing Back Empire in the Age of the Nation State. Then we have Leila Amse Erdo <laughs> Erdogudla, right? Um, with, um, with Afterlives of Empire, Post-Ottoman Muslims in Southeastern Europe. And last but certainly not least, we have our very own David Mozafi Haller, right here, you know him. <laughs> Light onto the nations, the phantom paints of empire captured in Israeli family photography. The floor is all yours. And I will, I will say that the Thank you. I want to thank our benefactors, the Fondation Pierre Dubois. I want to thank Cyrus, of course, our intrepid leader. I want to thank the indefatigable, that means tireless, David, who has kept us all together because he has that beautiful smile. And I want to thank you guys for teaching me so much as an advanced superannuated graduate student over these last couple of days. What I want to do in my brief time here is explore the question of definitions of nation and empire and how being more careful about definition, even though it may seem a little flat-footed, uh, helps us to explain things. I'm going to talk briefly at the end of this talk about three empires, contiguous territorial empires, the Romanov, the Ottoman, uh, and the uh, Habsburg. I begin by thinking about the fact that from roughly the 18th through the 20th centuries, modern empires dominated the globe. And these imperial regimes, as we've learned over these couple of days, existed in a brutally competitive environment in which success by one or another empire, particularly on the European continent, at a certain point, presented a threat to the others. In other words, there was no imperialism without trans-imperial and inter-imperial rivalries. And even as empires found new fertile fields to exploit and colonize, the globe seemed to many of them bounded, limited, and the anarchy of the international order encouraged one imperial power to expand at the cost of another until two great imperial war wars in the early and mid 20th centuries brought one empire after another to collapse or retreat. And the last empire standing then saw themselves as nation states, even while others might reasonably conclude that they were in essence empires. Those two, the United States and the Soviet Union, of course, were self-denying empires. As you know well, since roughly, roughly 1983, to be precise, there's been a shift in the, in the way we think about nations. The claim now is that nations are modern, humanly constructed political foundation formations based on ideas of shared culture. And this was an enormous, great paradigm shift in the thinking about nation nationalities and nationalism. And it's been extraordinarily fruitful over these decades. What I'm trying to do in the book that I'm writing called Forging the Nation, The Making and Faking of Nationalisms, 
is in fact to see how something which I call the discourse of the nation, a cluster of ideas about what constitutes the nation in our current 19th and particularly 20th and 21st century understanding of nation and differs from earlier uses of nation came together. How various tropes that go back to the Old Testament, like the chosen people, or in antique uh, Greece, like barbarians and civilization, were transferred, developed, and brought back, revived, often forgotten, but then part of this cluster of ideas so that, that became dominant, particularly at the end of the 18th century with the French Revolution, when the nation was then said to be uh, commensurate with the people, uh, and then consolidated, in a sense, after the fall of Napoleon in what I call in my book the moment of the nation. The moment of the nation from roughly 1815 to 1848 is when that, those ideas become more crystallized and become a kind of signifier that's going to then go on in, some, in a very familiar form to the present. In that moment of the nation, however, the idea nation was still contested. Kings were claiming they were the nation. Our, our aristocracies, like the Schlachter in Poland or the Hungarian magnates, they claimed they were the nation. But eventually, great uh, theorists like Mazzini and others consolidated the idea that it's actually the people following the French Revolution that make up the nation. So the nation, I would argue, in its full splendor, was only possible once there was a discourse of the nation cobbled together in this period. And then you have the idea that, in fact, the people constitute the nation. It's territorial. It's sovereign. It should have a state of its own. It, is a, uh, it should own a piece of the world's real estate, namely its rodina or its, its uh, a, a homeland. And it, it represents a kind of rational passion, an emotional or fervor, because the nation is not only strategically useful to people, but it is an affective community. As we're all aware, that makes it both salient, powerful, and absolutely dangerous. This emotion or fervor, this affective expression of national identity is said in this discourse to be fully realized only in statehood, in territory, and popular sovereignty. Now, in the, this discourse of the nation, you could say in a new way, and there are pre precedents to this, in a new way, culture determines politics. So the culture can be ethnic culture, right? We're all French, we all speak French, we, you know, smoke cigarettes and things like that. Or it can be civic, as in the United States or originally in the French Revolution. But it's a very interesting thing that, a, that a, the belief in a shared culture gives you suddenly, legitimizes the right to politics, to self-determination, to autonomy, to statehood, to territory, and so forth. That's a powerful change. And that's, that, that, of course, can lead to terrible things like ethnic cleansing, all kinds of assimilation, forced assimilation, or, need I say, as an Armenian, a, a genocide. So that, it seems to me, is what we mean by nation in a modern sense. Uh, and that's what it's come to mean, whatever its earlier precursors and precocious uh, uh, antecedents were. Once this discourse became hegemonic, it was completely naturalized. It was simply assumed to have been eternally present. And now, in our time, people act, think, exist, kill, die for the nation, which is taken as a natural order of things. So that's basically what I see as a nation. And I think if one has relatively firm you know, definition, you can then talk about how it's maintained. And we can have explanations that derive if we know what we're actually talking about. And historians don't like those kinds of things. I spent 10 years at the University of Chicago in the political science department. And I was told, don't say it's complicated. <laughs> don't say that. We're looking for parsimonious explanations, not complicated. But historians love complications. Let's, complex, let's make it more complex, right? Uh, so, so, you know, I'm caught between these two stools because we don't want to oversimplify and reduce, but at the same time, we want to have at least be clear about what we're trying to say. Now, for empire, empire, I also try in some way to define, and it's not so easy because, as we've seen, there's unbelievable variety over time, over space, over geographies, in cultures, etc. cetera. 
But I would say, unlike the nation and the nation state, which is based in a kind of harmony or homogeneity and egalitarian or, or horizontal equivalence among people who are thought to be citizens. So those are the two distinguishing factors of nations, this, this uh, attempt to be harmonious or homogeneous and to be egalitarian. You can see how many nations don't fit this ideal type right, right away. Imperial states, that is empires, are distinguished by a particular form of government, one based not on equality, not on homogeneity, but on institutionalized, legalized differences between those who rule and those who are ruled. And here it's very important because the ascribed super superiority of some is what justifies their rule over others. The British in India, they're white, they're supreme, they have railroads, they have guns, uh, or the, the, the ruling institution uh, Askeri or whoever in the, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the monarchs, the nobles over peasants, the white Britons over Indians. Thus, empire is marked, unlike the nation and the nation state, by difference and inequality. The right to rule is conferred precisely on the elite, precisely because they're superior, perhaps by their culture, their civilization, even their blood, their birth, or their race and imposed by physical force, as it is. It's already 10 minutes? Oh, boje uh, Because of what, what it is, uh, I will be brief now, which means I'm going to go on forever. So uh, it seems to me if we have that, then we understand empires will want to maintain precisely that difference. They have to maintain the difference because they have to have someone superior over others. One little moment to say something about these three empires. <laughs> the three empires before World War I had different kinds of strategies of how to maintain themselves. What's interesting is none of them succeed in becoming anything like a nation state. Part of the structure of difference, superiority and inferiority, prevented that from happening. OK, the Russians, they tried all kinds of things. They tried Russification. That didn't work. Cultural Russification, bureaucratic Russification, it didn't work. The state council right to the end and others were, gonna, were determined that they were not going to give up their privileges, and the empire fell apart. The second, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, very interestingly, they decentralized. They tried to sort of incorporate the idea of the nation. But ultimately, and despite the wonderful revisionist views of people like Peter Judson and Tara, uh, Tara Zara and so forth, which I very much enjoy, when you actually read the work, you see how powerful, uh, in fact, the threat of those nationalities was to any kind of supra-imperial uh, identity. And finally, the Ottomans. The Ottomans tried everything, as we heard from Vladimir and from Lale and others. And we'll probably hear again in a moment. The Ottomans tried the Tanzimat. They tried Ottomanism. We're going to bring everybody in civic equality. That didn't work. They tried with, with, uh, uh, with Abdul Hamid some kind of alliance. I wouldn't say pan-Islamic, but I'd say some kind of alliance between, between the Kurds and, and the, the, the Ottomans, the Turks in the Hamidia. Didn't work. Massacres, of course, especially against Armenians. And finally, they tried the ultimate genocide to try to create a more homogeneous empire. I would say this. The, we should be very careful. The Ottomans were not creating an ethno-national state a la Kemal or Kemalism. They were, they were empire preservers. They were trying to keep an empire, but they were trying to keep an empire which was more Turkic, more Islamic, a kind of heaven folk <laughs> empire in which these Muslims, and particularly Turks, they didn't even trust the Kurds after a while, were going to be the dominant people. And who were the victims? My ancestors. Thank you very much. <laughs> We can see you. We can see you. I think you can uh, turn on. <laughs>
can see your slides too. Um, can you say something? Hello? Yes, we can hear you too. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cyrus, for inviting me to this truly intellectually exciting event. And I hope to, I'm deeply disappointed to not be there in person. I hope to follow up with many of you since it's very clear to me that we are grappling with some of the same problems. So today I want to talk a little bit about bringing empire back to the age of the nation state. And my <laughs> new book project, which I hope to have come out in the next year, um, the birth of the geopolitical age, global frontiers, and the making of modern China. The project started from this insight that how is it that China has preserved its imperial territories and reconciled it with the language of the nation state? And I argue that it's really this new geopolitical discourse which allows it to do that. Try to move my slide. Okay. So what I try to do is to show that as historians, are you not seeing my slide? No, we can see. Okay. So what I try to do is as how do we as historians make sense of various lives that cross political boundaries and successive regimes in many instances, falling into the interstices between in national histories, cross imperial boundaries and political periodizations. And moreover, that these are people who um, in, in these technical fields of, uh, so I am looking using the global history as a model because of the focus on connections but also these insights from network science to examine this period of history from the 19th into the 20th century as a series of hubs, both intellectual and also physical infrastructural hubs with social scientists and scientists playing these connecting roles. And I focus on the fields of geography and agricultural science because both of these areas predated the rise of modern science, but also played important roles in the creation of the technocratic underpinnings of imperial discourse. So I examine things like Hokkaido in the 1870s, Chicago in the 1890s, Suiyuan, which is in Northwestern China, and also uh, people like Horace Capron, Isaiah Bowman, Ellen Zempel, Tan Yu, Takaoka Kumao, Mark Ziering, Paul Robach, etc. So dozens of these figures, and they're all connected in very interesting ways because someone like Max Ziering, for example, is uh, he is the student of Gustav Schmoller, which Mark Palin's paper mentioned yesterday. Uh, this group of social scientists uh, with transatlantic ties um, but also, uh, so, uh, one of the uh, this leading figures, academic figures in the intercolonization movement in Germany, but also someone who influenced Takaoka Kumau, who was a social scientist and agronomist, agronomist, who was a brother of the colonial director in Hokkaido, but then later on also studied uh, Japanese immigration to Brazil. Zeering was also cl closely connected to international agronomist networks, including with Cornell University. And that's where Tang Xiyu received his PhD in 1924. Interestingly enough, in his English language works, he talks about intercolonization and encourages it as a model of development in China. But in Chinese, as I will talk about shortly, he uses very different language. So these are all these figures who are connected and intersect at multiple points in their lives and actually cross these imperial and national divides. Where I am particularly interested in agricultural science is the idea of the frontier as an experimental zone. <clears throat> 
So the first uh, use of experiment in Japanese occurs in 19, 1847 in a work on chemistry. So it, it includes illustrations of an electric battery. This is one of those works that is included in the category of rangaku, so meaning Dutch, so Western science. Within a few decades, the Japanese had coined a neologism using the term already exists in classical Chinese to experiment, shiyan, but also adding this marker, this experimental zone as a distinct location. So the Japanese began to build exper agricultural experimental zones on the frontiers of empire, so on the border with Korea in Northeast China, but interestingly, so do the Chinese, and that is because agriculture is already a area of study for the Chinese elite. So in works such as the periodical Nong Xue Bao at the Journal of Agriculture, um, which is published in Shanghai, you see uh, many translations, many directly from Japanese, also in certain cases actually, uh, it was translated into Japanese from Western language sources. Many of this, the content is actually not all that useful, but in, when you look at the interest, this indicates also that there was opening across the country, not just in places like Shanghai, but throughout the country, these agricultural experimental zones, as well as the formation of agriculture societies. And if you look at the profiles of those who are involved in these efforts, you see that these are local elites who are participants in the revolution that brought down the Qing Empire, but also these are participants in educational reforms and they're opening these agricultural and forestry experimental zones in places like this. In this case, the map is from the city of Dali in southwest China in Yunnan province. So what we see is this combination and also this cross back and forth circulation of terms. So in Japan, in the settlement of Hokkaido in the 1870s, the original word that is used is tonden, which comes from classical Chinese, tuntian, the use of frontier garrisons to settle these frontier areas. Another classical Chinese term that is also use is kaiken, so land reclamation. The Japanese, by the end of the 19th century, coined this new neologism, shokumenshi, colonization, and it circulates back to China, but it is not often used in Chinese in the early 20th century. And people are very clear about the reason why they don't use that colonization, because they do not see what they're doing as the same as what the Japanese are doing. So they use this new term, Twinkun, because claiming that it comes from all the way from the Han Dynasty, from early China. So using native examples, even though clearly they were aware of what is going on in Japan and in other parts of the world. What you see is that linguistically, very interesting new terms are coming in. So Japan, for example, uh, describes the settlement of Hokkaido as, you know, settling virgin land. And they get that from the American, uh, the, from, uh, from American sources. In China, this land, virgin land also gets to be a term, but it, it doesn't come from Japan, but rather from translations of Russian works. So Sholokov, translations of Quietly Flows the Dawn, uh, is where this term virgin land comes from, Chu Nu Di. What we also see in is that this through these professional organizations, such as the International Congress of Geography, these ideas about settlement comes through. So here is a picture of Isaiah Bowman, who uh, is through the director of the American Geographical Societies, later on as the founder of the Council of Foreign Relations and president of Johns Hopkins University. But already in his 1921 bestseller work, The New World, but also in his various language, his various works and publications in foreign affairs and in other writings, 
he is talking about the role of geographers now, no longer as environmentalists, but today as capacitators. That the course of empire now follows all compass directions. The earth tolerance and man's resistance and endurance have been vastly widened by modern science. I want to be very clear that, in fact, this, uh, uh, his, his racism and anti-Semitism is actually just openly in his writings. So he talks about Chinese settlers in Manchuria, for example, that they're succeeding because they, you know, just breed like crazy. They're fecundity. Bowman is key to American foreign policy and this idea of, of empire as deterritorialized particularly in the post-war period. And his influence is also can be seen in Werner Bush's Bush's uh, uh, this, this, this document that founded the National S uh, Science uh, Foundation. But although Bowman corresponded with Chinese geographers and also with Chinese officials, um, so you see these points of intersection. But Bowman also failed to recognize what was happening in China at the same time um, and in the previous decades, which is a domestic example of frontier settlement that comes from people like the military official in the Northeast, Zhou Zhuhua, who connects Chinese Twinken to the Han Dynasty uh, as a counter to Japanese imperialism and Russian Soviet imperialism. You also see circulating in Chinese uh, media various coverage of Japanese reclamation in the Northeast. In this case, describing the German settlement of Eastern Europe in 1940 uh, about Palestine. <laughs> so there is attention to these global examples. At the same time, these domestic, domestic examples undertaken by warlords in this case uh, of the resettlement of the uh, of the northwest, the Suiyuan area, pushing back Mongols in this region, and of rural settlement plans. These are plans for these um, new villages, uh, gridded design, schools, settlement, factories, etc. <laughs> as well as during the war, these various inner colonization or reclamation farms using refugee labor. Um, I, I don't have time to go into this, but this, uh, this was not terribly successful in part because of the difficulties of actually uh, logistical difficulties of during the war. But in, after 1949, the communists take up the mantle of intercolonization and undertake in Xinjiang this Twinkum, now billed as a domestic example. Again, not, not Chinese colonization, but rather borrowing from this imperial example. So it's not just a nationalist, it's not just the political right, but also on the left, the communists, who are uh, undertaking this settlement of these areas, in this case in Xinjiang, also in the early 50s, including recruiting and transporting thousands of women so that they would marry the men who were already in, in, in Xinjiang to undertake and settle down and uh, reclaim these areas. So many of the, the, at the, in the early 50s, the gender ratio in Xinjiang was 160 to one of male, female. So this is why they specifically transported women so that they would get married to the soldiers left over in this region. Um, and so what I want to conclude with is this idea that um, linguistically what you see is that there is a, a degree of evasion that what the Chinese are doing is not colonization because that's what the West, that's what Japan does but rather that what the Chinese are claim to be doing is this histor using historical examples. Um, but in fact, when you delve into it, they are borrowing uh, from, these, from these other empires and even figures who claim to have, this, to have this revisionist history, in fact, come from very elite cosmopolitan backgrounds. So the military officer, Zhou Zhuhua, for example, that I mentioned earlier, he attended Imperial Military Academy in Japan. Um, and the agronomist Tang Yu got his PhD at Cornell. 
So these people are all connected through these elite professional networks. So I'm going to end here. Thank you. the last panel, but I'm really excited now. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me into the organizers. Um, today, I will talk about a um, case study of Habsburg, Bosnia, Herzegovina, as a way to think about how uh, trans-imperial and inter-imperial analysis offers an alternative viewpoint of Southeastern Europe that is not present in historiography. Southeastern Europe persisted as the site of struggle over imperial territories and spheres of interest, especially in the 19th century, the uh, spheres of interest of Ottoman, Habsburg, and Russian empires. For both the Ottomans and the, uh, the Habsburg empires, Bosnia was indicative of the long 19th century dilemma of how to resolve the contradictions of maintaining the supremacy of a territorially vast uh, multicultural empire with the modern principle of so principles of sovereignty and legitimacy, increasingly based on ethno-linguistic uh, hom ethnolinguistically homogeneous nation states. Their policies in Bosnia can be seen as experimentation with possible solutions to these imperial predicaments. As the Ottoman and Habsburg Empire overlapped uh, in the province of Bosnia-Herzegovina, they created spaces for Bosnian Muslims in, in particular to navigate the Ottoman and Habsburg realms and develop a relationship with the new authorities in Vienna as well as transform their interactions with Istanbul uh, and even broader to, with, with the Islamic world, or Muslim world. They did so in a rather limited space, we could even say wiggle room, within and between the two empires to influence and sometimes instigate diplomatic action, uh, imperial policies, and public opinion in both empires. The Congress of Berlin in 1878 convened by the European powers for the purpose of what they termed the Eastern Question, allowed Austria-Hungary to govern Ottoman-Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, Ottoman the Treaty of Berlin left Bosnia a sovereign territory of the Sultan, but under Austrian administration. Since the unique and legally vague status of such an occupation and administration was also new, the Habsburg and Ottoman empires and their shared subjects now had an opportunity to exploit the treaty's gray areas. Due to this ambiguous nature of the Bosnian occupation, where the old sovereign was still sovereign, but the population was expected to show allegiance to a new ruler and participate in the new uh, system of administration, the Muslims had opportunities at consuming various distinct legal protections. For the period from 1878 to 1908, certainly, the choice of allegiance was not singular, and the Muslims were able to navigate belonging to the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Habsburg monarchy, in addition to a myriad of local and regional arrangements. Bosnian Muslims petitioned for religious, human, and civil rights, aware of protections offered in exchange for acknowledging imperial legitimacy. Milestones in the Habsburg takeover of the province, uh, so the initial military occupation, uh, conscription law, um, annexation in 1908, were all the, uh, uh, were at the same time causes of international controversy where the two empires exerted diplomatic weight. Their subjects similarly reacted to incite further diplomatic action and secure their positions within both empires. And they did this in, in all three cases with uh, migration and threats of migration. The fact that Ottoman sovereignty over this province in the Berlin Treaty was legally structured in the religious context and that the link to the Ottoman Empire was spelled out in the relationship with the Muslim as well as Orthodox Christian uh, spiritual leaders in Istanbul, uh, the, the Sultan Caliph, the Sheikh al-Islam, and, and the Orthodox Patriarch, uh, highlighted the role of religious rights and religious identity in interactions with both imperial administrations. The Habsburgs treated Bosnian subjects as religious rather than national groups, essentially reviving the Ottoman uh, military arrangements. <clears throat> 
Amid ethno-religious local politics where emerging national groups in southeastern Europe relied on support of European powers with regional interests, Bosnian Muslims learned to use their religious and political clout too. They fashioned a new bond with the Ottoman Empire, and in some ways considering it closer and the relationship more dependent uh, than it was in the turbulent last century of Ottoman rule. And I can talk more about this uh, with the sort of difficult implementation of Tanzimat and then becoming this pilot province for Tanzimat province uh, uh, policies. The sophistication of the petitioners' ex uh, exploitation of contemporary politics is evident in the ways in which they presented their grievances, formulated as violations of Ottoman sovereignty, of <coughs> Ottoman rights uh, in the region, uh, even trampling of uh, Islam, uh, slander of Ottoman reputation, and so on. They articulated the demands to both empires, basing them on close reading of interna uh, international agreements using terminology such as contemporary civilized norms, um, universal natural rights, uh, rights of individuals under civilized governments, and so on. Importantly, what made Habsburg occupation of Bosnia different from other territorial losses in Ottoman Europe was that uh, its Muslim population was protected by the new administration and considered crucial for the Habsburg plans in the province, mainly to, to offset nationalist projects in, in, within the monarchy. While most regions in southeastern Europe worked to homogenize their populations by all means necessary after separating from the Ottoman Empire, Bosnia-Herzegovina preserved its diversity, and specifically its Muslims, precisely because of Habsburg rule. The Habsburg administration hoped for Muslim cooperation in separating the province from the Ottoman Empire and incorporating it into the Habsburg domains. The policies uh, focused on attracting and persuading Muslims to seek patronage from the Habsburg Emperor and see him, and not the Sultan Caliph, as the protector of Bosnian Muslim rights or, or interests. The Habsburg monarchy, having had, having had experience with het, uh, heterogeneous populations, but for the first time having Muslim subjects, investigated how other empires, uh, Russia, France, uh, France in North Africa, Great Britain and India, dealt with their respective Muslim populations and acted to incorporate Islamic institutions <coughs> into the Habsburg uh, state system. Austria-Hungary ultimately modified the existing Ottoman Islamic religious hierarchy and made it part of the Habsburg monarchy. In response to Bosnian uh, Muslim lobbying, the institution became semi-autonomous and lasted beyond both empires uh, to the present. Bosnian Muslims ended up seeing the monarchy as the protector of their rights. The emperor might not have become the defender of Islam, but he was definitely called upon to uphold Bosnian Muslims' legal rights. Bosnian Muslim activists and intellectuals skillfully engaged with both empires in claiming their transimperial trans rights and protections, petitioning the sultan as well as the emperor. Their efforts were uh, oriented toward concrete solutions uh, to issues such as Muslim activity in Central and Eastern European uh, political, nationalist milieu, uh, education, uh, educational and Islamic religious institutions within a non-Muslim state apparatus. Um, here, Lakh is, is very important, these Islamic pious endowments that are uh, vast and profitable in much of Southeastern Europe, and they, they get nationalized and appropriated by various governments afterwards. They encouraged uh, modernization, which they saw, and uh, these intellectuals encouraged modernization, which they saw as inseparable from modernity, and per, uh, participation in the Habsburg and Eastern European uh, intellectual, educational, and political life. Many prominent intellectuals also were influenced by developments in. Uh, Vienna, Budapest, and, and Paris, but also Istanbul and Cairo. Uh, and they closely followed the activities of Muslims in Russia, in Bulgaria, uh, thinking of their circumstances as similar to those uh, in Bosnia. These connections were forged, to answer Cyrus's uh, comment, uh, because of new ease of travel as well as proliferation of the press uh, from Malaya to, to Bosnia. And there, there's actually translations of Malayan articles in Bosnian papers of the early 19th and 20th century. Um, political and intellectual activity and the institutions they created, including something called the Islamic community and the Islamic educational establishments, uh, which are very important, were a product of these uh, inter-Islamic 
developments within trans-imperial trans networks. And in, I can explain later how in historiography that's often presented as um, Europeanization, but it has very different origins. What is more, Bosnian Muslims not only drew on, but also influenced and shaped the broader Muslim modernist discourse. For example, um, discouragement of migration from Bosnia to the Ottoman Empire uh, that, that took hold during the Habsburg period were hailed in the Bulgarian press, uh, Muslim press, uh, as an example to follow. Similarly, there were calls in Egypt by specifically Muhammad Abdu, the, the Mufti of Egypt, to model the Islamic education, the, the educational structure, on what was created in Habsburg, Bosnia. These considerations also help us envision Muslim modernity, not only as a one or a two-sided uh, account of European influences and Muslim reactions, but as a larger story of an interconnected trans-imperial world. All these Bosnian Muslim, inst uh, uh, Muslim institutions, political parties, religious educational organizations, associate, cultural associations, all functioned within the Habsburg uh, provincial system, uh, which was special in, in comparison uh, to uh, the rest of the monarchy. But they also uh, incorporated Ottoman laws, practices, and symbolic ties to, to Istanbul, even names. Bosnian Muslim uh, publications portray themselves as part of overlapping global uh, communities of Muslims, of Slavs, um, citizens of the civilized world. Um, these actors' environments uh, were at the intersection of imperial and national, as well as European, Ottoman, Balkan, uh, and Muslim intellectual trajectories, which are often consider considered separate and even contradictory, and, and they're also studied as, uh, as uh, separate. Yet the overlap of these affiliations shaped the way in which modernity was mediated and experienced by the province's people, deconstructing the historical boundaries between Europe and whatever, it, whatever its east is, uh, Eastern Europe or the, the Orient in quotation marks, was at any, uh, whatever, whatever it was at any time, uh, allows for incorporation of Islamic intellectual uh, history in the history of Europe and uh, contribute a dimension to, uh, sadly, still current discussions of Muslim cultural and religious compatibilities. Um, I'm finishing. So trans-imperial uh, and inter-imperial perspective, therefore, uh, lets us rethink the conventional historiography and uh, disciplinary boundaries. So uh, for much of the 20th century, scholars treated Muslims in southeastern Europe as anomalous remnant of Ottoman rule and the site of east-west encounter, a uh, symbolic bridge or occasionally physical site of the clash of civilizations. Contrary to these historiographer, historiographical assumptions where post-Ottoman Muslims lingered on as recipients of imperial and national policies or yet unable to adjust to modernity because they're Muslim, uh, by bring, uh, bringing these separate historiographies and sources together shows that they understood their predicament and seized the moment in all its complexity. More broadly, in rethink rethinking this history as trans-imperial and inter-imperial history makes obvious that it is necessary to consider the Ottoman context even after its formal departure from the region and recognize the trans-regional connections and networks across empires that continue to be pertinent even beyond the demise of the Habsburg Habsburgs and the Ottomans. Thank you. Lower the lights a bit. All right. <clears throat> Shortly after trying and failing to secure an invitation to the Bandan Conference in April 1955, 
the Israeli Foreign Office launched a campaign designed to create ties with the newly independent states of Sub-Saharan Africa. Over the next few years, at the same time when Israel's erstwhile nemesis, Gamal Abdel Nasser, established the United Arab Republic, the Israeli foreign affairs campaign of containment of what they considered an existential threat represented by Nasser bagged a number of significant diplomatic wins. Starting with the established Starting with the established African states of Ethiopia and Liberia, with which diplomatic ties were established in 1956 and 1957 respectively, Israel swiftly inaugurated official ties with Ghana in 1958, with Congo, Nigeria, and the Ivory Coast in 1960, and with Tanzania in 1961. Then the proverbial floodgates were opened. By the end of the first decade of decolonization in Africa, by which I mean 1956 to 1967, Israel had established official ties with 33 out of Africa's 41 sovereign nations. At the basis of many of the relations that followed stood numerous development projects in agriculture, water management, frontier settlement, youth movements, military training, arms sales, healthcare provision, and infrastructure construction that African governments commissioned from the Israelis. This process of decolonization and ambitious nation building also coincided with the unprecedented availability of photography. So what I want to do today is use photographs taken by one Israeli family, the Gershonis, during a relatively short stay of several years in Accra, Ghana, during the late 1950s and early 1960s, to explore what I believe may be a productive entry point into some of the discussions we've been having during this conference. While this effort is still very much in its infancy, I want to share my working hypothesis with you now. Namely, that in these photographs we find a mix of the kind of gaze and scholars that writers such as Patricia Hayes, Drew Thompson, James Ryan and Teju Cole had identified in their analyses of colonial European photography, as well as a new modernist aesthetic, one that relied on tropes such as khaki state officials and heavy construction equipment to depart a distinctive nation building technocratic ideal. At the same time, the Gershoni family album also contains many photographs that depicted leisure activities, for want of a better term. In those photographs, I find the hegemonic ideal of middle-class post-war consumerism, one that emitted chiefly from the United States of America. The Gershonis, photographed here in the mid-1960s, mid to late 1960s, let's say, this is calculating from their age, uh, were part of an upwardly mobile social group that rode the development industry straight into the crossroad of empire and post-colony. Their photographs tell us a story about how the ascendant Israeli middle class navigated this decolonizing world, one where the colonial color line meant they lived in segregated neighborhoods, much like Ulrike's paper yesterday showed. That same color line meant that the Gershonis enjoyed the material comforts and cultural capital of whiteness during their stay in Ghana. These photographs then are an account of how they tried to play the part. Uh, a part we must admit that they did not invent and which they didn't entirely adopt either. Many of the Gershoni's photographs from this period depict a household with local domestic service workers. We see drivers, maids, gardeners, and a variety of domestic service workers, which I can't really define what exactly they did. All of them are unnamed in the photographs' back sides. The interlocutors I speak to today, the Gershoni children, uh, largely remember them, but quite hazily. On one occasion, for instance, I've been told an anecdote involving a maid by one sibling 
only to be immediately contested in the details by another. Another strand of photographs depicts a family outing. Here, the domestic workers disappear from the frame, leaving one to wonder who took these photographs of the entire family in the first place, but also who prepared these neat picnic baskets. We can divide these outing photographs into two rough parts. One, which is picnics at the park or uh, sorties to the beach, where any detail that might betray that we are in Accra, Ghana, uh, is nowhere to be found, actually. The second part is what I might call um, touristic excursions. There, we do see Ghanaians, but playing roles you could only call the colorful native. We also have an extensive collection of photographs uh, I'm provisionally calling Dad's work. Um, <laughs> here, the family poses in front of shining new bridges or in front of heavy construction equipment, otherwise in front of um, major landmarks in Accra, Ghana of the time, such as Kwame Nkrumah's statue here or the Parliament House. Finally, there are numerous photographs from the children's school, an all-Israeli school, it so happens, where children of Israeli expats studied exclusively with each other, and where Israeli state curriculum was adhered to. Photographs in schools, however, were taken on rare occasions. Um, for instance, when Foreign Minister Golda Meir comes to visit, or uh, for instance, and no less rarely to be, uh, as a matter of fact, when Ghanaian kids are invited for a highly publicized visit. So, let me switch back to the home slide. A desktop. What might all this have to say? Uh, about trans-imperial or and inter-imperial history. Uh, and why have I chosen to call my talk today the phantom pains of empire, besides the fact that I think it sounds cool? <laughs> uh, besides, uh, perhaps we can follow what is now, I think, a conference tradition and resort to leaving you with another C word. Uh, the one I'd, pro I'd propose with regard to the relationship between nation-building projects and the empires that often preceded them and is relevant to this case here of the Israeli development workers, the first wave of the Israeli development workers, is cannibalization. In both what it chooses to depict <coughs> and what it chooses to ignore, the Gershoni family album evokes a nation-building project within a colonial world fashioned by Europe's empires. The focus of the entire family rather than as most imperial biographers do, or historians working on historical biography do, um, most of uh, imperial biographies do a very androcentric kind of study. That's what I find. They focus on men, they focus on what men did in their work, and men are depicted as these vessels of information and knowledge that somehow magically transports from one place to another. In focusing on the family, um, this kind of ideas can come to the fore. Um, this idea that there was this duality, this simultaneity of empire and nation state, this cultural cross currents in which the Gershonis took their first steps in what Christophe de Jung might have called the global middle class, uh, although I believe these people were middle class, they were certainly not bourgeoisie. The photographs we've seen are simultaneously proud records uh, of Amram, the father, and his role in harnessing technological prog 
progress in service of nation building in Ghana and of the colonial, spatial, cultural and social structures in which he and his family lived as he did so. The imperial world is being cannibalized by the nation building project. For the Israeli families who consider themselves the midwives of this transition, the colonial world is a source of both rejection and fascination. As, as I've written in greater detail in the paper I've presented in the last Beer de Bois conference, uh, they consciously fashion their own comportment um, in contrast to what they seemed, what they thought of as the white European colonial official. But still, as we see from the picnic pictures with the smarty candies, I can go back there, um, the cowboy hats or the cat glasses, sunglasses, uh, the, cultural idea, I, the cultural ideals they were, imparting, they were imparting was also used to distance themselves of the European world was in fact another imperial or sub-imperial creation uh, one that is American consumerism. Um, and that make another C word, and I think that's a bit too much. Thank you. I'm just saying. Now she sees me, or she sees the room. She sees now you, and now she sees the room. Now she sees the room. Good. Okay. Sit her. Good. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, let's get started. Uh, let's start with Ulrike, and then I'm going to ram Ulrike. No, no, he's Ulrike is like. I would like to go back straight to Ronald's um, contribution, and I think you provoked us a little bit, Ronald. You were juxtaposing two forms of statelihood, nation and empire. But when I heard this, I thought, I simply don't buy that, because this is not formative for the 19th century at all. And I think what we have, and your um, great work has contributed us to, uh, to, to make us see that, is that we have merging entities. We have merging forms of statelihood. And I think a lot of papers here, they actually showed that in a range of spheres um, where nation and empire intersected with each other. Um, so I would rather argue that, and other people also, Alexei has done that, we have imperializing nation states and we have nationalizing empires at least starting in the middle of the 19th century. And where it gets really important to look at, and I think a lot of papers did this, what happens if, for example, imperial elites are trying to introduce national politics in the empires, and the other way around, if sort of national guys try to use imperial formations to change that statelihood. And it's, it's exactly these sort of interstitions and sort of mergers which are of high interest. And I think we saw a lot of these papers, you know, exemplarily doing that. But I simply don't buy that anymore from the 19th century to totally sort of, you know, uh, divide between nations and empires. Because I think one way of trans-imperializing empires, one of the many stimulating ways we have heard here, is to see what makes imperializing nation states compared with um, nationalizing empires. Um, who else around Ulrike is um, <laughs> would like to have a word right now? Okay, in this case, let's have um, uh, yeah, Alex and, uh, yes, please, let's start. Yeah. And then Daniel. Or Daniel, just oh, no, 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 right it's okay. 
Thank you. Well, uh, I was just feeling, but this remains for the final discussion, that uh, we would still need to, to speak a bit more about the definition of empire and what is meant by empire and who... Uh, well, this is... I, I find it very complicated and I feel more and more uneasy about that. But I have a question for David, rather, that has to do with uh, this idea of uh, whatever global middle class. Because I was just wondering, I mean, uh, of course, you say that, they, that these... Um, Israeli ad experts in a in a newly independent state, they they uh, refer to to colonial uh, to, to colonial items and items that are linked to the colonial administrator. But I was just wondering. I mean, uh, I'm not a visual historian, and uh, I may perhaps not have seen that many photographs, although being interested in Ghanaian history. But um, I wonder. I mean, if the if the engineer uh, were either. I don't know, someone British who already was in the colonial service, but also someone, a, a Ghanaian engineer trained in these years. I think that many of the behaviors that were photographed would be the same. Uh, so the question is, what would that tell us? I don't know. I don't want to say that your case is not special, uh, and I think there's much to be to, to be done about that. But still, I, it feels a bit like there might be something that doesn't exclude uh, the new national elites either. So um, I don't know what you think about that. Okay. Um, now I've got a question that is primarily for Lila, but in a way it also relates to Ronald's uh, um, presentation because, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic project and I'm interested in, you know, what, what you spoke about in the way that the, uh, after the, the uh, you know, occupation and then later on the annexation of, of Bosnia, how Habsburg officials seek information and seek to learn from other empires. So that I, I can see that the value of, of doing that and how something like, I think from what I know about the historiography, a lot of it with regard to Bosnia and the Habsburg monarchy gets seen as a problem in international relations rather than an issue actually for, for, for officials, for policy, for ruling over different populations. So I can... Uh, Certainly, I, I find that an exciting project, but I was wondering also how we can look at this in terms of the uh, historiography of dealing with nationalism in a multinational empire, of dealing with different populations, um, and the kind of challenges that, that the dual monarchy experiences at that point in time, which then relates to, to, to the other presentation. Uh, and I'm thinking about this in particular. I mean, you said, Lila, that you know, on the one hand, of course, there are very significant challenges in terms of ruling over diverse populations, the centrifugal tendencies within the monarchy at the turn of the century. Um, but you said what is different is the kind of question of, you know, religious minorities having a Muslim population in this context. But of course, it's also, this is also the period when, you know, in the Austrian part, the Cisleithanian part of Habsburg, uh, Austria, we can see the rise of you know, political anti-Semitism as a really significant force and how the question of minorities that are not primar primarily defined in national terms suddenly gets put on the agenda as well. And you know, like Austrian leaders, and you know, many of them are a bit you know, uncomfortable about Luega and, and, and so on and the, and the impact that uh, Luega and Schönerer and so on have. So I was wondering whether there's a way of also framing this in terms of a contribution to the kind of Habsburg literature and dealing with that, that kind of story where, where the Bosnian, as far as I'm aware of the literature, the Bosnian part barely gets, gets covered in, in, in depth, and certainly not. So thanks. Can I stop here and then have an extra later, please? So, uh, first of all, I agree with you completely. That is, uh, I always tell my students, before you give a talk, don't make any excuses. Right? So, but I read the first three pages of this paper and then was told to stop. So here's, here's the strategy. This is the strategy, was can we define what we mean by nation in an ideal typical sense, right, a definition, and what we mean by empire, and see how those two things might work as a spectrum in which there'll be all kinds of, in the real world, 
complex interactions between the two, precisely the way you said, nationalizing empires. That's what I think ultimately, the, in some ways, not ethno-nationalizing, but nationalizing the Ottomans were doing and so forth. So that's, that, that's the concept. But as uh, Leila said very much at the beginning of her talk, there's a funny kind of effect of what this discourse of the nation powerful as it is, transnational as it is, does to empires, right? And then you have to test each case to see, is it real nationalism doing this? Or is this language of nationalism, this discourse, which others are trying to adjust to, so that, that the Russians think, well, how, how can we nationalize this empire? What do we do? Some want to do it. They don't do it very well. Others cannot think of getting rid of, of the diversity, uh, of finding some civil explanation that will cover them all, of really russifying or ethnicizing the whole empire. So I absolutely agree that what, what this is, is about is that there, there are these two different ways of thinking of politics and ways of ruling, and they're totally in con contradict contradictory to one another in some sense, at least at the, as, at the, the political and discursive sense. What you actually have is all kinds of hybrids in between, right? So that, and, and I'll say one more thing, maybe you will explain this. I also see the Soviet Union as an empire, right? It's very important to think of the Soviet Union as an empire that's about diversity, all kinds of institutionalized inequalities, some people, the nomenclatura, superior over others, etc. And the Ottoman Empire, very much so in a similar way. And what's very interesting is, how do those two empires, the Ottoman, and the, and the Soviet end. It's the core that leaves. <laughs> in other words, it's Russia that leaves and destroys the empire. And it's the Turks in the form of Kemalism that ultimately pull out and leave Istanbul and the Sultan hanging, right? So very interestingly that, that the appeal to one or another of these, you can call them ideal types or discourses, has, has drastic effects on whether or not you can maintain these odd, hybrid, nationalizing, uh, imperializing efforts. Modern nations today, all over the world, are like mini empires, right? They don't, they haven't uh, uh, achieved these impossible utopian goals of total homogenization and egalitarianism. It's just, it's a utopian project. It's more utopian than communism. Sorry to say that. Did you want me to comment as well on that? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I also agree. There's this um, burst of experimentation with all kinds of things because primarily nationalism that threatens these Ottomans and the Habsburgs, and you know, uh, it's it's uh, it's really a um, a very sensitive time for these two empires that are um, sort of being judged by other empires for being so multicultural all of a sudden. And, and the Habsburgs are very um, eager to show how their model works. Uh, and uh, especially in the beginning of the occupation of, of Bosnia, they're very careful with these new Muslims and their Orient, which is contiguous territory. It's not some colony far away. Uh, and but they, they still can't they don't treat it as uh, the other provinces so uh, and the treaty limits uh, or, or we could say limit but also opens new ways of thinking about how to treat this new population that is also that I mean the province itself is 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 mixed uh, religiously mixed uh, so uh, it's several layers of different diversities that they're, they're, they're dealing with. Um, and these, the Berlin Treaty and the, the subsequent agreement that they have with the Ottomans is kind of vague. So I'll, I'll give you an example. They, um, and then this is also to your uh, question, um, when, uh, because this uh, religious connection to Istanbul is um, in, the, in the treaties is enshrined as unimpeded and you know the, the Austrians as local administration will not interfere into in this, uh, the Ottomans continue to treat it as their 
province and they appoint a mufti. And, and the Austrians don't want another administrator from the Ottoman Empire coming in, even if it's a, a religious uh, figure. So what they use is an example of Tunisia. And they said, look, Tunisia, it's the, it's, it, it's the, the local uh, the bay who appoints the mufti. So we're just using your example and your practice to appoint our own mufti here. <laughs> and what, what they do is kind of a compromise. They appoint the existing mufti of the capital as the mufti of the province. So there's kind of like not offending the Ottomans completely, but also not letting them appoint anyone in the province. Uh, and you know they can do that because it's not very, it's not clearly specified in this in this agreement. And it's, there's this heightened reading of these agreements and uh, by the empires, by the empire's lawyers, but also uh, the population itself, uh, the, 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 ver the various groups that want to kind of push for their uh, interest and uh, propose a different reading and then lobby with both empires for, for these readings. So, um, yes. Right. Uh, and the other question was about um, uh, the dealing with populations. Yes, it's very interesting how they, uh, the Habsburgs investigate how to deal with Muslims, and this institutionalization is, is a big part of uh, envisioning this new group as part of uh, the, the empire. So uh, the, the religious hierarchy with, with the Orthodox Christians and the Catholic, Catholics is, is a bit easier, but then they, they do those first. Uh, and, and then they invite the Muslims, well, don't you want to have this nice title of Reis ul which is a, a newly kind of invented title, but it sounds really good. Uh, and we'll give you this high honor and a, a very pretty ceremony, and they go to see the emperor and so on. Um, but the Muslims also use this as an opportunity, and they lobby for this uh, institution to be autonomous. And, and they succeed uh, uh, after, after several years. Um, what, what is at stake for them is, as I said, is Islamic pious endowments. It's a lot of money. Uh, and which finances the schools, the, the mosques, everything that's all these so, social, cultural, uh, economic institutions of, of the province. And then there's this, of course, this um, tension over who gets to control the money, the money that, that comes out of it. Um, so looking at what other empires are doing and what works and what doesn't work with Sharia, with uh, um, education, is, is, is very important. And there was another uh, question that kind of located in the Habsburg context. Oh yes, as well. yes. So. Um, the Habsburg and, and subsequent, uh, you know, as the Ottoman Empire retreats from its territories in, in Europe, this becomes Europe, right? <laughs> the moment what the province is lost, it's all of a sudden European. It's not the Orient anymore. So. Uh, there's that border that kind of moves of what is Europe. Uh, but Bosnia, because of its Muslims, so the other areas kind of expel or kill or you know, minimize the number of Muslims they have, uh, but the, the Habsburgs don't want to do that because they're really afraid of um, the nationalisms that are already brewing in other provinces and you know, the, the Slavs, the Pan Panslavic, Illyrians, and they're kind of fraternizing with the Hungarians, and these are all problems, and uh, there was a lot of opposition to actually including Bosnia uh, into Habsburg Empire. One was cost, and another one was, look, we don't need more Slavs. Right? We already have issues with Slavs. We don't want more uh, uh, Slav populations that, that will plug into this pan-Slavic uh, or pan-Slavism that, that was kind of brewing and, and, and parties and all, all this. Uh, so that, that was one, one aspect there of uh, how Habsburgs reacted, but if, you, if we look at the historiography, it's very much this, like, this Ottoman province became European, and now it's modernized, and uh, it entered the, uh, you know, the, the modern period, right, at 1878, and uh, it's not only the, the Habsburg and, and subsequent sort of Central European, but also Eastern European and Yugoslav, uh, reading of this history, it's like modernity starts in 1878 because it becomes part of uh, Bosnia. But, but again, uh, looking at the Ottoman context, we see this 
uh, modernization of institutions, of uh, everything, much earlier in the 19th century as part of this Tanzimat reforms uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And Bosnia becomes the pilot province where all these new measures were um, tested uh, and, and were actually successful. So it was kind of like uh, the elites were against it at the beginning, but they were crushed and then it worked out. But then the, there's the occupation and, uh, and um, uh, introducing, re or reintroducing, I, I could say, uh, Ottoman context and Ottoman sources, more importantly, shows that this is really not the cutoff point. There's a lot more in terms of continuities that we can talk about, imperial continuities and Ottoman continuities in this region than, uh, than it's led to believe. So, from, from the historiography. David. Yeah. Um, what makes them unique? I mean, in one regard, I guess they're not unique. Uh, they are no different substantially than uh, any other upwardly mobile social group. Uh, but I would like add to that, that when talking to them, you get a sense, of course, that all this was new to them. I think it's also communicated in the photographs. What's special, I think, in the Israeli case is first that the Israeli middle class has this very strong streak of trying to say that we were poor not very long ago. We come from want. Uh, therefore, we deserve this, is the implication. Um, and so a lot of these stories will, will be, yes, and we had a maid, could you believe it? That's crazy. We had a driver, that's crazy. And I think some of that kind of energy is communicated in the photographs. And also more broadly, not only from the photographs themselves, is that I think in the Israeli case, you see a lot of state hand-holding of these upwardly mobile social groups. You see that in the state funds their schools, the foreign ministry visits those schools. The photographs themselves, I don't know if you saw the watermarks on the photographs that I showed, they come from an online database that is called Israel Revealed. And it still exists now, it's available to everyone, and it's basically the online database says, we will use family and personal photographic collections to tell the story of the nation. So, yes, their lives wouldn't have been qualitatively different from, say, for instance, Yugoslav uh, experts, many of whom were also in Africa at that time, many of whom were also trying to <coughs> wear khakis and say, we're like you, we're socialists, we're going to build a new world after the colonial bastards are gone. Um, but I think in Israeli, it's like, it's very, very state-directed. So it's a social, upperly social group, very rapid social mobility, sponsored and controlled and protected and cherished by the state. That would be what I said. Could I ask so just on a question too? Yeah. So in the Israeli, particularly in the Israeli case, could this be read as also Israel making an effort to, or you know, claiming legitimacy by participating in a European project, colonial project, in a sense? I think for them it was, you know, it's very... I mean, for Israel, it's not necessarily the family, but just... It was a very kind of sense of being, you know, what Homi Baba was like, white but not quite. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, for them it was a sense of, we're in an exclusive club now, we are the developers, you know. We've developed ourselves and now we can develop others. So I think there is a sense of, yes, of, of achievement. Um, a lot of what they say is like, oh, we studied, you know, my best friend was French and the other was an Englishman, you know, and they have the sense of living in the enclave of experts, mm -hmm. of the expat community, of this kind of exclusive club that we remember as kids. Uh, so yeah, I think that energy is definitely there. Now, I think there, there was a question for Shalom, right? So uh, uh, Shalom, please. Uh, so the question is about the role of different territorial proprietary regimes in shaping, limiting, or enabling reclamation campaigns. Um, 
And I'm actually, I am still actually thinking about a comment that Ronald just made about uh, how the Turks and Russians pulling out caused the collapse of empires. Uh, and I think that is the, the um, that maybe that's the difference with the Qing is that it's already a minority rule of a, uh, a conquest regime and that the Han Chinese in claiming to the nation, they did not want to give up the territory. Um, so uh, I think my answer to also to the question about territorial regimes is less than that, uh, you know, the kind of regime it is, but rather this process of historical revision. Because in both the case of Japan and China, uh, Japan had already uh, these relations in Hokkaido and was also Okinawa before um, it's before the Meiji Restoration and these efforts to then incorporate them into part of the Japanese Empire. But um, it's about the way that they actually then repackaged it and using some of the language borrowed from abroad to to kind of claim it as reclaiming wasteland. And in the Chinese case, it's even more contradictory because there is both an effort to portray these Northwestern, Northeastern territories as virgin land, but also in the case of the Northwest and especially in Inner Mongolia and Mongolia, to also Inner Mongolia area to say that this is the cradle of Chinese civilization. So how can you be both the cradle of civilization and also virgin land? It just makes no logical <laughs> sense whatsoever. Um, so I, I, I think it's less about the kind of territorial regimes in place, but more about this process of historical revision, but also evasion. Uh, that we don't want to use certain terms or we do want to use certain terms. And what Martin was saying yesterday, I think it's actually quite important the way this transitional period in the late 19th century, when Japan goes from borrowing from the Chinese imperial examples uh, to then turning to the West. Um, and in turn, kind of trying to erase that the fact that it, it, it very much still in the early 1870s modeled itself after the Chinese imperial example. Thank you so much. Now, we have seven questions. I won't take, <laughs> I won't take new ones. We have 20 minutes left, okay? So I want, if possible, each question to be 30 seconds long. Just be very fast, because these guys here have another 15 minutes to go. Otherwise, it won't be. I start with a question online, and you can go to Anisabel, who sits right there on the back. The question is from Moritz for Sheldon. Let me move here. Um, I really like the paper because it redirected attention to the charged use of language, terms, and traveling concepts. Describing a rural territory as wasteland was already a deeply colonial move in British India with important implications for land ownership and official claims to new territories to be made productive. My first question, and I will just stay with this one question, is about the role of different territorial proprietary regimes in shaping, limiting, or enabling reclamation campaigns in the countries you addressed. Now, now let's see. You addressed, okay, you addressed. It's not like I, I thought that was a question you meant. Uh, did I miss a question? Uh... Anuli, no, then I think we are actually, you are actually good. So you saw this question online. Perfect, okay. <laughs> I, am, I am too, I'm too engaged with trying to figure out exactly who will speak first. Very good, thank you. Anisabel, the turn is yours, and Moritz, my, my apologies. Thank you very much for these presentations. I have a, a, a question slash comment for, for David, and it's, it sort of relates to what uh, Alex was asking before. It sort of seems that you can, there are different ways to tell this story. It seems that there is this Israeli story, you suggest, because of the involvement of the state. Um, but um, you could also think about, like, sort of subaltern colonialisms and or well who who pretend that they're subaltern let's put it that way um, and I was also thinking of um, the sort of second world third world connections like uh, J uh, what's his name uh, James Marks um, work uh, about this where it's also like we we don't 
we're not from this club. But also what you, the example of the maid you had, I mean, think about all the Scandinavians that go to, to Africa in this period and also have this type of, of, of narrative. Um, very quickly, it also reminded me of Mike and Umbach's work where she looks at, uh, she's looked at German Jewish bourgeois tourists in Nazi Germany, which is also this really complicated story, which given the sort of memory politics that you suggest with this Israeli project, bring to mind. And then finally, a point about these schools. It struck me that this was a, just an Israeli school. But I mean, if you think about many of these other schools, German schools, French schools, etc., where they're actually mixed, and, and you see African kids as well as um, French kids or German kids or whatever. So it's a more mixing. So that might also be something to think about, like, what does the school do? And how is that fashion? And maybe this is a very nationalist project. Um, anyway, I'll stop here. <laughs> Lovely. Um, uh, David, I also had a question about legitimacy and self-fashioning, um, which was similar to Leila, so maybe I'll leave that for, for after. But um, my, my question is to Leila. Um, in terms of the, so I guess I have a similar question that you asked me in terms of legacies, and the, the title of your talk is After Lives of Empire. I wonder if, um, you know, and maybe this relates to also the question about the differences between, obviously I agree that there are similarities and continuity between empires and nation states, but in the context of these heterogeneous, multi-confessional, multi-ethnic types of empires, I wonder if um, in that, like this period of 1878 to 1908, when there's the possibility of overlapping and dual types of sovereignty in this region, do, do you see the afterlife of that as sort of putting Muslims in a position of then later being seen as a suspect other with outside loyalties, right? Like that, that may be part of the story of that transition from empire to future nation states is that these groups had outside potential sovereigns and authority figures and are somehow then suspect in a nation state where there's no room for this, this type of thing. Like, is, is that something that we can think of productively of like an afterlife of this this period of, of potential um, incorporation in, in, the, in this way that the Habsburgs attempt, but that end up making m Muslims sort of their position more precarious after the empire ends. So thank you. It's Martin, it's to your right. Now let me just give it oh, to I'm your so right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. I had a question for, uh, well, first of all, thanks to the whole panel, but I had a question for Shellen in particular. Um, the book's uh, clearly going to be great. We're really looking forward to it. Um, my question is to do with um, the role that German uh, scholarship and science seems to play in so many of the case studies that you're looking at. I mean, you're, you're I'm sure, more familiar with that than I am, but it seems that so many of the people you're looking at and the scientific networks go back to German scholarship. Um, and I wondered by what analytical frame can we think of that? Because that, that tradition of German mineralogy, of geology and so on is actually pre-imperial, right? Um, so, so to what extent is trans-imperial or inter-imperial or whatever we want to call it useful for you when you're thinking about a, a scientific tradition that comes from uh, a side that is neither a nation state nor an empire um, and then affecting places like the Qing Empire and the, the, the emerging uh, Japanese Empire. Alexei, he's right behind you. Uh, yeah. I trade my 30 seconds now for three minutes in the general discussion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Nadine and then Christoph. Thank you. Um, my question is also to Shalin. Um, and I thought, in a way, one could also frame your um, example of frontier settlements as a form of horizontal expansion. And as you being the author of sort of Empire of Coal, I also wondered how you would see sort of this frontier settlements in relationship with sort of a vertical expansion, namely coal, when you talk about this geopolitics and the age of sort of geology and so forth. So I was wondering how these two sort of would interlink or are interlinked and then also what you would gain from a trans-imperial approach um, 
approaching these sort of various forms of expansion, if you like. Thank you. And Christoph is right here. Yes, my question goes to David, and I would like to come back to the one C that you didn't particularly emphasize, but that pops out time and again, which is class. And I wondered whether these uh, phantom uh, pains of empire were not actually a middle class thing, because I, I mean, you, 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 as you rightly said, I mean, this, this family always was not bourgeois, but I mean, their lifestyle in Europe would have been pretty bourgeois with maidens and cooks and chauffeurs and whatever, but it's only something that they could do in the colonies. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I mean, if, if, if you think about a lower class uh, Israeli actor, seaman or whatever, they wouldn't have been able to afford this, this, this style of living. So m maybe, could, could you say a bit something more general about the relation between middle classness and colonialism, because they, they, they seem to converge maybe also in, in regards of uh, Fred Cooper's and Anne Laura Stoller's tensions of empire. So could, would there be a bigger argument in your micro story that you have told us? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start this time with Shalon and then go the other way around. Shalon, please. Um, so, thank you. So, to address a question about German scholarship, we're talking about a period when you see the professionalization of these scientific disciplines, as well as <coughs> these international congresses. So, the International Congress of Geography, for example, is still ongoing, um, and also of these agronomy conferences. Someone like Max Zering continued to be active in scholarship and to uh, be in contact with other agronomists about holding international conferences well up to his death in the late 1930s. So I see that is in a way that we need to be maybe more flexible about how we consider these uh, categories, spatial categories, as well as temporal categories. Um, because if we view it from these uh, scientific social science networks, um, then that actually, uh, you know, does not co neatly correspond with these um, imperial periodizations. Um, and so in that case, you see that also in people's work like Dan Rogers, Atlantic Crossings, you, there's a lot of this back and forth influence in, in terms of the founding of American economics, uh, social, sociology, et cetera, that they get their influence quite a bit by the German social sciences at the time. Um, and the same is true in Asia where the Japanese um, are quite influenced by these German disciplines. And you have people like Nitobe Inazo who get their PhDs in agronomy in Germany. Uh, and I actually have a, a, a theory, which I still can't prove, that Shokubenshi, the colonization, that the Japanese coin, uh, that, that, that I feel like it's because Nitobe is influenced in, by German word for platsun, so also used in a colonial sense settlement sense. Um, in terms of horizontal expansion versus vertical expansion, absolutely. And I see that in a lot in the way that these Han military officers appropriate the language of Western colonization, that these Mongols or these other ethnic minorities are wasting the potential of the land. And in that sense, they not only mean the, the agricultural development, but also the wasted opportunities to explore the exploit the natural resources. And that is what happens in Xinjiang, in the oil exploration in the Northeast, in terms of looking for mineral resources. Um, so they, this is a where I think for Han nationalists, there is no ideological reason why they need to hang on to territories that is primarily occupied by other ethnic um, groups. So what is the reasoning then? So what you see happening in the early 20th century is that people start to use this language borrowed from the West of uh, this wasted this wasted potential, that the Mongols are too backwards, that they are not developing these areas, 
um, and therefore the Han need to come in to extend the civilizing mission. Um, and I think uh, this is also related to uh, Morris's second question, which is online about um, <laughs> um, how how my work is going to challenge Ben Hopkins' authoritative study on global frontier governmentality. Mm -hmm. um, so I have yet to read Hopkins' book. It's, it's on my list of readings. But what I am trying to argue is that uh, modern state making as a process of coming from the outside in. So, and this is where I argue that where you see the frontier becoming like an agricultural experimental zone, but more broadly an experimental zone where states could try out these various, actually oftentimes a more interventionist and more aggressive developmental campaigns um, and then that makes its way uh, into the interior. Thank you so much. We have about, let's say, nine minutes left. So why don't each of you speak, let's say, for three minutes, and I'll try to implement that, better, if that's OK. Yeah? David, you go first. I'll speak for less and donate the rest of my minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, to Christoph's question, we, I hope we can talk about this also uh, later, but um, Definitely, I see in a way the kind of African, the career of an African expert, or like of an Israeli expert in Africa, is the ladder into the middle class. And then the question becomes, when do you screen all the possible candidates? And in my materials, I find really amusing things. For instance, one of their main, most greatest concerns is that... Um, the people are representative in which they mean they have undergone the Zionist revolution. They speak Hebrew. And then every now and then a government official returns from Africa, terrified, and submits a memo to his superior saying they've reverted to Yiddish. <laughs> and they forgot about their Israeliness and we're losing them and it's hurting our, our appeal. Um, but let's talk about this later. <laughs> Thank you, David. Leila. Yes, so Leila's question, thank you. Um, Muslims were singled out earlier than the Habsburg period. So this uh, romanticist na nationalism, you know, early this is turn of the 19th century, uh, they're called, although they're Slavs, they're called Turks. And sometimes uh, when there was consideration of incorporating that into the sort of South Slav national body or Croatian or Serbian, they're called our Turks. And the solution would be that they convert to Catholicism or Orthodox Christianity or revert to it, right? Uh, and then they could just participate. Um, this, this changes. There's many different versions of this. What the Habsburg period actually contributes is this um, experience of lobbying a political um, and associational life that is very valuable once the empires are gone and there's nobody to, to, in 1918, Bosnians are petitioning, can we be part of Hungary, please? <laughs> They're not to get into these na nation states because everybody knows what happens when you're in nation states, expulsion, um, you know, dispossession, forceful conversion, and all that. So um, Bosnians actually come into Yugoslavia of having this experience, and, and they, they have a head start, unlike uh, those in Macedonia, for example, who are just like, what is the expression, deer in headlights, kind of like, they're, they're just lambs for slaughter. And, and they have no such experience, and, and you know, the consequences were, were obvious. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Leila. Ron. Uh, thank you. I, I didn't have any questions, but <laughs> Lenin once said, seize, <laughs> seize every podium. <laughs> so, I'm going to make two points. First, it's interesting, of, of the empires I've been looking at, let's say the three I mentioned, the Hohenzollern as well, and the Soviet, none of them actually end in the way that would be predicted by the standard narrative that all of us have been fighting against. They don't end because of nationalism from below. Not even the Soviet, that's misunderstood. The Soviet Union committed suicide from the top, right? and then everyone fled. So I think that's really interesting, that, that paradigm, that, that the age of nationalism paradigm, which I think this conference is obviously undermining 
given the fact that this is really an age of empire that goes on until after the Second War, is far more important. But at the same time, there is this threat of this very powerful transnational discourse, namely of the nation, that everyone has to deal with. These empires on the eve of World War I are not giving up. They're trying to find ways to become modern or to become more national or whatever. And ultimately, it's the ones that lose the war, the four in the East, that, that, that disappear, but not the ones that win the war in the, in the West. Of the, of the, that's one thing. The other thing that I, I, I'd love to test sometime is the notion I call something the dilemma of empire. And the dilemma of empire is that what if an empire succeeds only too well? Hmm. Like, for instance, the Soviet empire. Let's say an empire has a civilizing mission or a developmentalist agenda. And they actually do civilize certain indigenous peoples and develop the country. At a certain point, like the Soviet Union by the 70s and 80s, who needs the empire? Who needs the nomenclatura when these peoples are ready to go off on their own, right? So there's a funny kind of dynamic or dilemma within some of these empires that eventually they're very, Success is their failure and ultimately will, will destroy them. Maybe that's for the good. Thank you so much, Rome. <laughs> and thank you so much again for this panel. Let's give them a hand. And now for something entirely different. <laughs> um, let me actually turn the thing now, as you're going to just sit. OK, so we have, we are perfect in time. Right, I turn it around. Yes. OK. Yeah? OK, wonderful. Um, OK, so we have 30 more minutes. Um, we are about 30 people, uh, for which reason I would suggest that, and I would assume that most of us have something to say that each of us really tries to keep to one minute. Otherwise, we will go. I mean, we'll just, we'll, not everybody will be able to speak if we don't, right? And those who go first will have you know, a sort of an unfair share as well. So let me try to be a good start, OK? I want to make, let me just make two points very quickly to start with, sort of general points, right? The first concerns all these Cs. I think on some level, they can be compared. But I also think on another, they refer to different things. Let me give you the basically example of competition, cooperation, connectivity. And they're starting to talk about this, and I want to talk more about it, right? It seems to me, I'll just throw this out there, that competition and cooperation refer to the effect of a trans-imperial relationship and its meaning that it has for its actors. While connectivity refers to the form and the way in which these happens. And these are somehow different things, right? Second point, and then I'll be done, social worlds. There are really different social worlds that we can see taking place transimperially. I think we need, and we have talked about this, right? Aristocrats, traders, laborers, and we can look at them and think about them in really, really different ways. Also archivally, as Martin so beautifully pointed out. There's, of course, much more to say. I'll stop right here. So I'll try to do the maître de cérémonie, who would like to start? Let's start with Alexei, who gave up his right. Very good, and then we'll go around. So my three minutes. <laughs> uh, to begin with, I think that we need all the time to keep in mind that we need at least three words, not empire and nation state, but also nation. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, nation state uh, already, well, even in the early 20th century was absolutely not seen as a norm. Just read 14 points by Wilson and you will realize how strange the idea of the nation state was to this guy in 1918. Uh, now, that is first point. Second point, uh, we shouldn't try, even try, to give a definition of empire for a very simple reason. 
because uh, empire has existed for more than for thousands of years, and they were changing in time, plus they are very big and complex structures, uh, which means that when you look at existing definitions of empires, they always describe an elephant from one certain perspective. And when you look around an elephant, uh, when you have this occasion, you will understand that you always see only a part. Final point, uh, we have to uh, uh, look at uh, uh, how uh, empire uh, and nationalism uh, interact and coexist. Because, uh, well, during our debate today, uh, there were two points which struck me. One was, okay, uh, nation states as small empires. Be careful, this way we can end up seriously treating Bokassa as an emperor. Uh, second, uh, uh, the idea that, uh, well, it, it will take too long to explain. Uh, <laughs> and we can talk about it later over a beautiful drink at six. So we have uh, Ulrike was first, I think, and then let's go to um, yeah, Ulrike, then uh, Mark, then Daniel. I'd like to make three points, actors, entities, spheres. And when I think what to bring home from this conference, I think actors and groups bridging, transcending empires came out but we were too much concentrating on metropolitan agents and metropolitan actors. And I think we haven't really looked sufficiently enough to colonized uh, people, to colonized actors and their, way, their ways to sort of circumvent, undermine uh, imperial strategies very often by global repertoires. So this would be one critic critique um, in relation to actors. Entities, I think I made my point. I just want to add, I would have enjoyed seeing more or hearing more about imperial legacies. Leila made a point today, but I think this is a really important way to trans-imperialize, in a way, empires. And maybe with regard to um, Ronald, this great book of Michael Meeker, An Empire of Nations, came out in the 80s, an American scholar of Ottoman studies. And he sketched out you know, how the Turkey, modern Turkey, was based socially on imperial elites. And just this, this name of this book, An Empire of Nations, I think uh, says exactly better than I can do it. What I think one task <clears throat> was a little bit missing here, what, what we should approach in the future. And the last point, spheres. I felt that on this conference, similar like in research, economy is still neglected. We have been so focusing on identities, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's time to bring economy back into the game. And with economy, we bring the global factor very strongly back. And just one example. Um, Christoph was making uh, his point with the German uh, merchants in India. But what about the Mavari guys? These are an ethnic elite from Bengal. They are dominating the global market of jute in World War I. They are an absolute global elite by sort of selling their jute to Australia and we are not in World War I. So these are sort of the local actors with global resources, which I think we should more look at and investigate in order to get the economy back in this whole picture of trans-imperializing empires. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, after three days of very stimulating discussion, I probably have to disappoint you. I can't offer any definitive definition of empire, and even more disappointing also of trans imperial history or of the concept of a trans 
imperialism. But uh, I think in the case of the later of transimperial history, it has not only to do that I just don't feel fit after three days of discussion to do so, but also very much with the fact that we, I still see it more as a method and approach, a perspective than a theory. And uh, this said, I would say that, uh, we have seen that there are now many different seas around and uh, I think we have just to decide on a very individual basis which one are useful in uh, which case and so on. And uh, I will be here completely open. But uh, there, there has been, and uh, I have now two and a half uh, points to make about uh, transimperial history. Uh, one will be this uh, thing between inter-imperial and trans-imperial. And I have to admit, I'm a little bit biased here, but I would still stick with the term trans-imperial because I think it's connecting better to transnational global history and to this kind of trends. And we have seen quite a lot of papers also pointing to people who are really in between the empires. And I think uh, that, that could be the better point. I just wonder what others are thinking about this, but I would stick with uh, trans-imperial. Uh, and. Um, I think it's also a good way to challenge just the nationalized history from two points, from this transnational and global uh, perspective, but also from a post-colonial, imperial, colonial history perspective. We haven't spoken so much about this, and Florian made this point. And the last short uh, point, uh, I think uh, we can see now a real development in the last five years. There was a kind of trans-imperial history avant la lettre, and then five years ago, you, you could see that some people are using this term, but now we have a much richer uh, uh, field. And I'm just looking forward to how it, it will develop. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess and it, it, it connects rather nicely to, the, to those two points. Um, uh, oh, I hope it does. Uh, I, I'd say, first of all, before we get maybe too caught up in battles of definitions, which sometimes can happen at these things. Um, I, I would say that uh, I don't think we have to recreate the wheel here. Um, I think there's a really useful starting point uh, uh, within the context of the US empire, at least. Uh, uh, Kristen Hoganson and, and Jay Sexton, uh, in their introduction to the recently published Crossing Empires, actually take great care in, in defining these terms and separating them out. And you know, we might disagree with them, but I think maybe we can. that's a good starting point for, for how we define these terms and separate them out. Uh, and then just to add to this issue of economy and add another C that has come up a little bit, I think, in some of the questions and, and, and a few of the uh, presentations, and that's cooperativism, 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 cooperativism. There you go. <laughs> easy, easier, easy, to, easy to write, not easy to say. Uh, maybe that's why we didn't say it. Um, uh, and that's the international cooperative movement that uh, by the 1920s and 1930s is probably the, the biggest uh, uh, non-governmental uh, movement uh, in the entire world, uh, and it crosses across all the empires uh, that we've been talking about and beyond. And it's this this third way, uh, uh, consumer-oriented nonprofit movement that, of course, I'm sure we've all been in, in co-ops in our lives. But this is it, it's in the inner warriors. So those working on the 20th century in particular, I think we need to take more care to pay attention to the international cooperative movement here. I'm really going by order now. Okay, so just read. Yeah, I, I will come back to a remark that Paul, I think, made uh, on the first day that we should uh, uh, pay attention to these uh, the contexts uh, in which empires uh, are working. So um, the economy, economy, capitalism would, would be one of those uh, contexts, but maybe also uh, technology, uh, communication, um, development of Science, maybe also this 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 emergence of this this cultural artifact of nationalism, and then see how this affects empires and also how this affects transimperial I, I don't know uh, coalitions or conflicts or, or or whatever. Because then we would have something to think empire against. Because if we if we only think about empires, it's just. Yeah. We, we, we miss a dialectical movement that will be possible. Lolly, who is behind you? Um, I'm now a little not, I'm not quite as certain of what I wanted to say, but I think that actually 
I think the question here that we, I think it's actually important that many of us are using this term differently and that it would be a lot more useful to think about what this means because yeah. when we're talking to each other, it might be fine that we have different takes on what transimperial means, but when we're talking to other people, like there, there is something to be said for making the case that this is a method, right? That it's not that we're just studying connections or like, oh, we're looking at two different empires or whatever, but what what makes our stories trans-imperial and the ideas of how those types of connections reshape particular imperial histories, right? That there's something different than doing comparative history, <clears throat> that trans-imperialism should, you know, that, that maybe we need to think more of it as a method. And then another thing just that strikes me is that in some of the discussions, um, the commensurability question is, you know, for many of us where we know a little bit about another setting, but we don't necessarily understand particular power relations, is something that in that came out, I think, a lot in the Q and A with particular context, and that maybe we need to think a little bit more about power in these international contexts. So I'm thinking here is actually about the last paper and um, David, the photographs, right? That like comparing. Israeli families in Africa to African people of the same class is not the same thing, right? That that actually having to think in that trans-imperial context that there is a very different story because of those power relations. And then I think that that fell out a lot in our discussions. Next on my list is Ivy. Um, thank you. I, one of the things I've been thinking about, um, especially this sort of crystallizing in this last panel, that I think helps me, is helping me think about how to identify those connections and, and maybe to think about um, what, what we're thinking about as trans-imperial is when, I'm, when I think about the competitive emulation, we've seen so many different examples of competitive emulation. And it, it, it seems like there's so many different ways in which empire builders um, looked for models and reasons why they looked for different models, whether it had to do with ideology or, or nationalism or national identity and some kind of understanding of the relationship between that nation empire and other nation empires, or it was a, about having a grab bag of different you know, imperial practices, uh, which I don't know, I mean, I had a question for Shellen about that, but like some of those images seem like almost like, oh, here's some random you know, examples of how you reclaim land, or if it had to do with these other non, not necessarily imperial networks of ideas, actors, thinkers, and, and the, thinking about that, thinking about how em, empire builders maybe, um, how they looked for models, it also has the potential to open up more room for non-imperial actors, uh, colonized actors. I'm thinking of a question that Cyrus posed to me via email about, uh, about how you know, Muslims in North Africa influenced Italian identities of, of or it, Italian ideas about Islam. So that's, those are my, my kind of <laughs> Yeah, I think when the uh, kind of uh, vogue for transnational history started, uh, quite a few people tried to emphasize that transnational history was not a method, but a, a perspective. And uh, I, I think, you know, probably that could be said about trans-imperial history as well. But thinking about the different papers, I'm not even quite sure whether we all speak about one particular perspective. So this is partly kind of picking up what Daniel, Lale, and others have said, so is there actually a perspective that characterizes trans-imperial approaches? And over the last three days, uh, we've heard about uh, institutions, we've heard about various issues, and we've heard about various ideas. One thing that I probably expected a bit more after Ulrike's paper was to hear more about individuals, and uh, about those individual stories that sometimes uh, allow us to, 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 to look at trans-imperial experiences, perspectives and voices, and so on. But that's probably more the kind of cultural side of me uh, thinking about that. Uh, these are just some thoughts. Uh, happy to pass on now. Um, now, uh, Shellen, please. 
Thank you. Actually, that this is a, a, what I was also thinking about the units of analysis and also the categories and how we think about transimperial. In fact, it seems like a number of us are actually working on individuals, but also in the narrative of individuals and their life trajectories, crosses empires and also nation states and these boundaries in various ways that actually break down these kind of containers and how we examine this period of history. Um, and I was also thinking that one uh, area that we uh, actually did not talk about is about the perhaps the different maybe breaking down the divide between blue water colonization versus contiguous or inner colonization. Um, and the way that that also, when we look at these individuals, rather than in these larger, you know, trans-imperial or inter-imperial uh, as a mode of analysis, that when that, in fact, you see that how that difference is kind of obliterated by that. Thank you so much, Alexander. <laughs> who is right here. Well, yes, just a couple of worries. I mean, I'm still struggling with the thought that, uh, let's say, Habsburg rule over uh, a certain region of Romania is exactly the same thing as, well, the same thing. It's very close to what British rule over <laughs> Uh, the Igbo in Southeast Nigeria means. So I was just wondering, I mean, are there not differences in the forms of othering within colonial rule, especially because if I think of many of the, of the projects of ruling over non-Europeans by European colonial empires, they seem to me much closer, for example, to what's going on in Latin American nation state projects and their forms of internal rule over Amerindians or Indios or whatever. So the question is, do these categories really work? And a small remark, uh, because this I'm perhaps a bit more sensitive to that and feel on safer ground too. Uh, the, also, when some terms are used, like ethnicity, I think they are mm -hmm. used in very different ways. And this, again, would need some clarification. Yeah. Um, now, before we go on to um, Paul, you can pass it on to Paul, who's right here. Just Paul, one second. So those online, please, if you want to make a comment, just raise your hand so I can know, okay? Um, raise your hand like, you know, the raise hands, whatever, symbol or whatever that's called, yeah? So we know whether you want to say something. Paul, you're next up. Okay, um, so, you know, what this discussion is bringing to mind for me is the question of what is at stake in these meta-historiographic labels. Yeah. Um, you know, if we think about this as a trajectory or a set of conversations that, you know, is evolving out of conversations about transnational uh, or global history, for example, does it matter what we call these enterprises or not? And I think it certainly does up to a point. Um, but it's worth thinking about why and how they matter and then where they don't. Where does it stop mattering? Um, uh, I think it matters in terms of the connotations that these terms have in directing and organizing our imaginations and our attention as scholars. Does it direct us to elite, middle class, subaltern actors? Does it direct our imagination to metropolitan or peripheral spaces, et cetera? I think it also matters in terms of how they structure our method methodologies and research practices, right? It matters whether you are thinking of what you're doing as transnational, international, uh, global, et cetera. Um, that said, I think transimperial certainly does some things that other forms and other designations uh, have done in terms of pointing our attention to connectivities between national histories and across these boundaries, and in some ways making us um, think critically about our own practices and about these um, deeply internalized and encrusted and institutionalized forms of methodological nationalism and, and imperialism. Um, so that's something that I don't know whether it matters that much, whether we call it transimperial or transnational, et cetera, up to that point. But what I do think that transimperial does, which is really important, is it foregrounds questions of unequal, asymmetric, and dominating power in ways um, that transnational history, um, which emerged out of a kind of 1990s conversation about globalization, foregrounded flows, connections, interactions as an end unto themselves and valorize those, connect on those connotations in ways that 1990s globalization discourse uh, did. 
And in that respect, I think transimperial history opens up a more critical politics vis-a-vis -vis questions of transnational and global inequality and injustice that arguably should attract our attention. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think Anisabel was next. I saw you. It's good. You're on the list. No, no, but first Anisabel will go by, by the road. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, this something else that came to mind. I mean, obviously, this is about modern trans-imperial and inter-imperial histories, yeah. but your point reminded me that the criticism, I, I, I think I'm, I'm slightly more uh, positive towards transnational history, but the point that a lot of early modernists always made about transnational history, it doesn't work in the early modern period, and actually trans-imperial might, although, again, you need to think about what it means if you do this in an early modern period. But I think, actually, to make these histories a bit longer going backwards, but also going forward, um, and I'll say something about that in a second. Um, the other point I wanted to raise is that the distinction between an approach or a perspective of how you exactly want to call it and it as a topic, because I think some papers were very much about the top, like having a topic that is trans-imperial or inter-imperial, and others really emphasize more the method. And I still think it's worth, they interact, but it's still worth making a, a, a distinction. What I saw a lot as well is how individuals, I mean, they, they are there sometimes, but how they go between scales mm -hmm. and how they, how they go from the imperial to the national, just to take the uh, last uh, um, 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 panel as an example. Something I also miss a little bit is Ulrika's point about economics. And um, I think that might also be interesting if you think about a longer history going forward. So um, into the 70s, NIEO type stuff about what is the, the, the post-colonial, somebody mentioned the colonial predicament, the post-colonial predicament, and, and how that plays out. So I think their economics is really something that um, we need to pay attention to. And that might also bring Latin America back into our story. And I completely take uh, Alex's point about like, we need to be careful about how we look at different regions. But at the same time, it, it, it's also worth thinking about them as comparative cases, also to see where they differ, uh, without trying to flatten things as well, some of the criticism towards transnational history uh, suggests. Thank you. Thank you Alex. Yeah. Um, so First of all, in, in this, whether to define or not define, um, the people who were touching that elephant were blind. And it seems to me that as historians, we're not blind. We, we need categories, we need things if we want to explain things. And I think that's been one of the good things. Uh, but following Alex's point, I, I'm sorry that Veronique is not here because she said something very wise early in the discussion. She said, well, you can use these terms in different ways, and maybe they appropriately have to be used in different ways. But use them and tell me how you're using them. That's what you tell your students, is if I'm going to say empire, I ought to have some idea what I'm talking about. And it may be different from your idea. So if we keep it kind of you know, loose, maybe that's a kind of radical middle position there. But I think that it's worth thinking about that. Uh, because as historians, we do celebrate complexity. We are against simplification and reductionism. At the same time, we also have to be for clarity, it seems to me. And ultimately, hopefully, some of us at least, want to explain things. <laughs> I have two more, Vladimir and then... Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's so many different methodological perspectives on how to do trans-imperial history. I don't think uh, there's a point of having like one coherent agenda. But I think there, there are two questions that every single one of us can ask uh, for how we do trans-imperial history and you know, for, for each new project. So the first question is, I think most of us are in agreement that we gain a lot by doing trans-imperial, inter-imperial history. What do we lose, right? And then can we live with that, with what we lose? And how do we minimize the losses in our work? And then the second question could be how to write trans-imperial history ethically, in an ethical manner. Because there is, there is a risk of privileging the state, privileging colonial, um, privileged colonial populations over colonized subjects, privileging colonial knowledge. So um, we can always remind ourselves what is at stake and um, what kind of gift we want to leave to the world? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Empires, empires in the history. Empires in the history, it means without limit. It means overseas, over oceans, over land. Yeah, with the times, since empires, then we can conquest. Well, the earth become biggest. And after the conquest, chronological, we arrived in the colonization area. But only one century after the colonization area, we was thinking about nation and state. But how? We should implement international law. And then each nation can have, could have their own state. We will see. But since the uh, one century after the colonizations, we uh, aircraft exist, and the, uh, the Earth become uh, uh, less than very far than. But the chronological nowadays, it's not by centuries, but by only by decades. We can say three decades. Every three decades, a new world, a new empire. Yes. So each nation, their own state, since the end of the 14th, since 16th, the 19th, and nowadays. Uh, in the 16th, the two superpower, two empire, yes. In the 19th, the unipolarity of the world. But three decades later, what it happened nowadays, the global globalization, the global world, it means the inter-global world. The inter-empires, the inter-globalization world. And this is l'histoire au présent. That's it. The last word goes to Mark. <laughs> Some we don't no, pressure. <laughs> yeah. no pressure, thank you. Um, well, I'm obviously biased, but something I also wanted to point out that I found um, missing it, at least explicitly was the environment and environmental history. I think some of us have really pointed at it so, to some extent more explicitly. Um, but I think this is really, this is an angle that can not only help us um, in our methodology and also in our understanding um, across different types of spaces, whatever we might want to call them, but also open up a bit more to other units of analysis. We had the tree, we had the tuna, um, we had the garden, but then all of these um, also have different types of mobility in and of themselves, and how does that change how we look into you know, empires and a more than human, um, I think, angle would be really important to also consider on top of everything we have um, summarized so far. Thank you so much. A great last point. <laughs> I think we have gotten to the end of three very intense days. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much again uh, to Irina and to the Dubois Foundation. Thank you to David, where are you? Thank <laughs> you.